Hey everyone, this is Laszlo Montgomery, and welcome to another episode of the China History Podcast. Not just any episode. To mark the occasion, my 10-year anniversary of being in this racket and presenting the CHP to you, I'm dredging up an old topic produced back in 2010. A lot of those earlier episodes, like your humble narrator, could use a little work done on them. And this topic in particular... Well, I didn't do it justice all those years ago, and for the longest time I've been saying I was going to give this one a total makeover. And here it is, for better or for worse. My deepest thanks to every one of you who have supported me all these years. Many of you have been with me since I hung out my shingle back in June 2010. And to everyone who just found the CHP recently and gave it a shot and have stuck around ever since, again... My eternal thanks and appreciation for your support and listenership. As I'm recording this in mid-2020, the year of the rat, I think it's safe to say U.S.-China relations have certainly seen better days. Years before COVID-19 became a household word, well, us and China, we've absolutely run each other through the ringer and made a difficult period in world history eh, much worse than it needed to be. Staring out at the wreckage of this U.S.-China relationship and all the mutual hostility spewed out in both directions at equal vileness, it might lead anyone to believe that it can't get any worse than this. Although I've been saying that since at least the end of 2018. So as we relive this history of those exciting days from 1969 to 1972, let's keep in mind both the U.S. and China are no strangers to bad relations. We've been here before. And we bounced back, as I'm sure we'll bounce back again. We worked out our differences back in the early 1970s, and believe me, there was a heck of a chasm that existed. I'm sure I speak for a lot of people in hoping that our respective leaders and everyone professionally, politically, or spiritually committed to improving the U.S.-China relationship will... Come together right now. There sure are enough mistakes and miscalculations on both sides to fulminate over and perhaps learn from. So without further ado, the focus of this episode is to look at the U.S.-China relationship during these years leading up to the secret visit of Dr. Henry Kissinger in July 1971 and all the back-channel discussions and drama that led up to the so-called week that changed the world in February 1972. It's been 48 years since Richard M. Nixon sat down with Mao Zedong and symbolically jump-started U.S.-China friendly relations. I was 13 at the time and not interested in politics yet, but I certainly recall when it happened and what a big sensation it was that President Nixon was going to red China, the first American president ever. I grew up in the Cold War days, and China, back then, on the news and in the public and political discourse, was called Red China and other names, but never the People's Republic, especially in U.S. diplomatic circles. (laughs) We showed them. In this internet age, where anyone within six feet of you is a potential news reporter, there's no way Nixon or anyone could have pulled off such a secret and dramatic coup. In this series, I wanted to relive those moments and show, chronologically, how events unfolded. Also in this series, I'd like to interject my narrative with selections of verbatim remarks from memos and transcripts of meetings involving all the key players in this great moment in history. In 2002, these formerly classified top-secret transcripts to all the meetings between the key players on the American and Chinese sides, everything had been transcribed and was made available to the public. And I'm going to present several excerpts from these historic meetings. It's one thing to read about the whole story of Nixon's visit to China, but to hear the four most important voices in their own words articulate how this new arrangement should work, well, it's quite something. As bad as things are right now with U.S.-China relations, actually, there was a time when it was much worse than this. And I thought, Before we begin our story in 1968 with the election of Richard Nixon as the 37th president of the United States, it might not be a bad idea to go back to the beginning and take a 
nice, lugubrious walk down memory lane and reminisce about USPRC relations and how, despite the differences that kept us apart for more than two decades, mutual interests finally brought us together, at last. As we know from more than a few past CHP episodes, the U.S. government and the Chinese Communist Party, going back to the famous Dixie Mission, 1944-1947, well, although they talked and talked and talked, in the end, we sided with the communist rival, Chiang Kai-shek, the Nationalist Party, the Republic of China. Almost from the moment the nationalist forces, and finally Jiang himself, vacated the Chinese mainland, the U.S. and China were at each other's throats. You think relations are tense today. In 1950, we were going all out to not make it easy for the PRC government. Established on October 1st, 1949, we immediately blocked all attempts to get the PRC into the U.N. and to isolate them internationally. Block China's rise was an open secret. The China seat continued to be held by the nationalist government, temporarily in exile on the island of Taiwan, off the coast of Fujian province. 1950 started off with a bang. Our embassy in Beijing was attacked and the vice consul got roughed up. Not a good sign. McCarthyism exploded onto the American scene. And then North Korea invaded South Korea, and the whole Korean War started. And that was just in the first six months of 1950. By the end of the year, U.S. forces were fighting Chinese People's Volunteer Army troops in the Korean winter. PVA troops that were led by none other than Marshal Peng De Huai. And we capped off that rotten year in U.S.-China relations by slapping a trade embargo on China that didn't get lifted for 21 years. This oft-called Forgotten War in Korea. The armistice was signed in July 1953, and after blasting away at each other the way they had over the past few years, relations between the U.S. and China couldn't have been more frostier. You'd think the U.S. and China might want to try and ratchet things down for a while, but as soon as the Korean War mop-up was finished, the U.S. and China went at it again over Taiwan. Chinese military started shelling the offshore islands of Jinmen and Matsu off the Fujian coast, but claimed and occupied by the government in Taiwan. At that time, led by our ally, President Chiang Kai-shek. And we signed the Mutual Defense Treaty in December 1954 with Chiang and assured him we had his back in the event that, you know who, tried to invade Taiwan or something along that line. This event that lasted September 3, 1954 to May 1, 1955, became known as the first Taiwan Straits Crisis. There were more than one. Three years later, they were at it again. And the remarks made by U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles back in 1954 eh, were no less bellicose or provocative than what Secretary Mike Pompeo has said. The present state of U.S.-China relations, these times we're having now amidst so much hatred and animosity, it's nothing new. The times and the historical circumstances are quite different from today, but what I'm saying is, we've been here before. Well, August 1955, things finally got so bad. Chinese and American diplomats, assisted with mutual go-betweens that both sides found acceptable, began having these meetings to see if the U.S. and PRC could throw each other a few bones to let some steam escape from the pressure cooker. This was a year after the Geneva Conference when John Foster Dulles made his famous about-face on Premier Zhou Enlai. They held these initial ambassadorial-level talks in Geneva. These chat sessions between American and Chinese diplomats it continued on and off from 1955 until the moment Henry Kissinger took over and began talking to Zhou Enlai personally. Summer of 1958, more tension in the Taiwan Strait, with Uncle Sam shaking his fist in China's direction, saying, they will defend Taiwan. This was the second Taiwan Straits crisis, August 23rd to September 22nd, 1958. Four weeks of each side teaching the other a lesson, and then everyone returned to their corners. The Great Leap Forward was going on in China at this time. 
So the PRC wasn't even 10 years old yet. The USA was not making it easy for them. And though our actions provided excellent fodder for the communist propaganda machine to boil up all this toxic kanji for the masses, it wasn't doing anything to help push the two countries together to explore what common interests that eh, maybe possibly existed between the two countries. Then in April 1960, there was a faint glimmer of light. Not much, just something that caught a lot of people's attention. China and Russia were already not on the best of terms since Khrushchev gave the secret speech on February 25th, 1956, George's 13th birthday. American officials were getting the sneaking suspicion that the PRC and USSR were having a major spat out in the open. Then in the months that followed, what was at first speculation about what was going on between these two neighbors became very evident. And in those final years, just before Beatlemania in the United States, the first public debate was beginning to heat up regarding U.S. policy towards China. But on June 18, 1960, birthday of you-know-who, President Dwight D. Eisenhower didn't mince any words when he visited Taiwan and declared, quote, the United States does not recognize the claim of the warlike and tyrannical communist regime in Beijing to speak for all the Chinese people. In the United Nations, we support the Republic of China, a founding member, as the only rightful representative of China in that organ. End quote. Oh, yeah. President Trump wasn't the first sitting U.S. president to make the kinds of hostile statements we've been hearing of late. Ike was a little more civil and articulate, but them was still fighting words. Nonetheless, by March 1961, our ambassadors and diplomats were in Warsaw holding discussions that were moving at a predictable snail's pace. These talks, first held in Geneva, had a change of venue on September 15, 1958, and were moved to the Michelovinsky Palace in Warsaw. JFK's administration was still solidly on Chiang Kai-shek's side, and there was no indication that any changes in that policy were even on the distant horizon. Over in China, well, they weren't sitting back and waiting for something to happen. Once again, in the summer of 1962, they began shelling the offshore islands of Jinmen and Matsu, and the U.S. had its third Taiwan Straits crisis on its hands and the specter of a real invasion by PRC troops who had amassed along the Fujian coast wasn't so far-fetched for people in the know. The official U.S. policy was that if China tried to invade Taiwan, the U.S. would intervene, and all that that meant. And if this didn't ratchet tensions up enough, a few months later came the Cuban Missile Crisis. We all know how that played out. Yeah, the world was a dangerous place. If you think this... Mudslinging going on in 2020 between the U.S. and PRC is something unprecedented. <laughs> Think again. Us American imperialists always made it easy for China to rake us over the coals and much of the propaganda churned out for the Lao Xing and China's friends in the third world. In August 1963, JFK had even publicly called China, quote, the greatest threat to peace since World War II. End quote. By this time, the Sino-Soviet split was really starting to heat up, and both sides kept flinging the same old, tired, bombastic, and juvenile communist rhetoric at each other. U.S. officials, no doubt, felt a sense of self-satisfaction watching this alliance start to circle the toilet bowl and hearing of reports of Soviet citizens being roughed up on the streets of Beijing. But as 1964 dawned, well, we all know what happens now, and none of it's going to be good for the United States in the end. August 7, 1964, came the famous Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and the Vietnam War was off and running. U.S.-China relations were going to have to be backburnered for the time being. Two months later, on October 16, 1964, China blew off their first atomic bomb, and in the process obtained a measure of respectability, national pride, and a chance to 
move the geopolitical chess pieces around the board a little, as far as their position in the global order went. By March 1965, the first U.S. troops started pouring into South Vietnam, and by the summer, once again, for the second time since the founding of the People's Republic, American and Chinese troops were directly and indirectly firing on each other on the battlefield. There had even been a case of U.S. and Chinese Air Force jets dueling over the South China Sea. So by 1965, the U.S. and China were at war with each other. Well, the following year, the Chinese nation took a few years off and Mao launched the Cultural Revolution. 1965 to 69, terrible years in China. Besides the internal havoc and destruction plaguing the country and society, the Soviets were amassing troops along their southern border where it met Xinjiang and the Manchurian provinces. That, no doubt, gave Mao cause for concern. But just as China started to lock down and begin their 10 years of chaos, a funny thing started to happen over in the USA. One by one, politicians started coming out and saying things uh, to the extent that, you know, we shouldn't ignore the PRC indefinitely and that the time had come to open a dialogue with them. This, of course, set off a very hotly contested debate. This was a subject that a lot of people felt very strongly about. 1960s? (laughs) The very notion of cozying up to communists and abandoning our friend and ally Taiwan was a very sensitive hot-button issue. Even the likes of Edward M. Kennedy and plenty of others were making a lot of noise about a two-China solution. In fact, that seemed to be a popular stopgap measure for a lot of American politicians. If you can't choose one, Why not choose both? Have your cake and eat it too. The two-China solution. Many Americans threw cold water on that idea, and it never gained much traction as a viable solution. And as far as the PRC and ROC were concerned, they didn't want to hear any of this. And by the way, neither did LBJ. As the U.S. got mired deeper and deeper into the Vietnam War, relations between China and the Soviets started to get more and more ugly. And in June of 1967, when China tested its first H-bomb, 3.3 megatons, that can do some damage. Leonid Brezhnev was surely not happy to hear that news. In a foreign affairs article from October 1967, well-known communist hater Richard M. Nixon wrote a piece that said U.S. policy, quote, must come urgently to grips with the reality of China and that we cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations, there to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. End quote. Nixon wasn't alone in thinking this way. More and more politicians from both political parties, and not just in the United States either, began calling for establishing relations with the PRC. But Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic of China government on Taiwan still had a few friends in Congress and in the executive branch, not to mention the U.S. military, who watched their back and vowed to counter any attempts within the government to stab our allies in the back. And so, with all this bad blood, hurt feelings, and tortured history that had come to define U.S.-China relations since 1949, and even before that, on August 8, 1968, After he had won the Republican nomination for president, Richard Nixon declared he would, quote, extend the hand of friendship to all people, specifically to the people of the People's Republic of China, end quote. Well, easier said than done. The Vietnam War was still raging and the Cultural Revolution was ripping Chinese society apart at the seams and the foul-tasting communist-flavored invective that the Chinese Communist Party was so expert at was still being flung in the direction of the USA, very much like today, but without the benefit of the Internet. On the face of it, this mutual enmity still had plenty of mileage left in it. The People's Daily had a few choice words to say about Nixon's overtures of peace in a January 27, 69 article that stated, quote, Although at the end of his rope, 
Nixon had the cheek to speak about the future. A man with one foot in the grave tries to console himself by dreaming of paradise. This is the delusion and writhing of a dying class. End quote. And in February 1969, when the secret bombing campaign of Cambodia started its four-year run, this did nothing to help bring the U.S. and China together. Cambodia was one of China's allies. Amidst all these bad vibes and nasty talk, on February 1st, 1969, President Nixon sent a memo to his national security advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger, and instructed him, to explore ways to improve U.S. PRC relations. But he added emphatically, quote, This, of course, should be done privately and under no circumstances get into the public prints from this direction. End quote. And we were off and running. Our story now begins. Do yourself a favor and join me next time in part two. We'll pick up early in the Nixon presidency and... See how both sides tiptoed through the wreckage of the Sino-American relationship and how world events gave both sides food for thought to come together and give peace a chance. Until that time, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the city of Los Angeles in America's most golden of states, begging you to join me next time for another exciting special 10-year anniversary episode of the China History Podcast.